Okay, thanks. Um, so I changed the title of my talk just slightly. Um, since Elena was just before me, I thought I could connect um, this MTP2 uh, property that Elena was talking to, to graphical models, and then tell you a bit about um, how that is like completely different and actually incompatible with causality, which is the topic that I wanted to talk about. Okay, <laughs> And it's uh, really incompatible in a very nice theoretical way. Um, so, okay, so graphical models, um, why do we love them or why do I love them? Um, so they capture uh, statistical dependencies between variables of interest, of course, in a, in a network, which often enhances interpretability um, and often also allows you to compute things um, faster than you could otherwise without these constraints. And depending on the, the application you're looking at, you might want to use very different graphical models. So in particular, if you look at, for example, weather forecasting, you know, you cannot intervene on, a weather, on the weather, right? So you might not care about causal relationships. You really only care about correlations among the weather, which you might want to use in order to actually do um, better predictions of the weather in different places. On the other hand, if you have medical applications, um, where you want to find new targets uh, for different kinds of biomedical interventions, well, you really do care about the causal relationships, right? I do want to know if I intervene on a particular gene what actually happens downstream. And so in these kinds of applications where you can intervene and where you want to say something about interventions, you really want to be using directed graphs which represent causal relationships. Um, and so for both of them, uh, frameworks have been developed. And so I think this is a beautiful theory that came together from um, three different areas. So first in the undirected setting, of course, this came out of statistical physics. Um, if you think of easing models and Gibbs distribution, et cetera, where you use undirected graphs to represent the distribution, sorry, um, in a large system of interacting particles. Um, and also in statistics, um, this came also in the undirected setting, again, in the discrete setting, uh, where people were looking at contingency tables, so these very high dimensional contingency tables, and looked at interactions between the different variables in the contingency tables and represented these by graphs. Um, and finally, and this is the directed setting and the causal setting, was also developed about at the same time uh, by Sewell Wright. Um, he was studying inheritance, um, and then of course if you study inheritance, you represent that by directed graphs, um, and these are causal graphs, right? And so all of these came together and, and built like this very nice uh, theory of um, graphical models that nicely combines this graph theory with probability theory um, into a very nice framework. And so um, I want to talk about causality, so this framework that was introduced by Sewell Wright. Um, but let's first think about what does MTP2 do on these graphical models. And we'll actually see that MTP2 is only compatible with this undirected setting and actually not compatible with anything causal. Okay, so why is that? So let's actually, so why do, were we even interested in this MTP2 constraint? So as Elina said, so we were really interested in different kinds of applications and this also gives some intuition for why it is not compatible with a causal setting. So we were interested in actually modeling positive dependence. Um, and let me give you a couple of examples and that already should hint at why it is actually really not causal. Um, so we care a lot about different applications in genomics. Um, so if you look at gene expression data, so it's um, nowadays very clear that, you know, if you look at the packing, like which genes are close to which other genes actually matters a lot for expression. Okay, so here's a little example. So inside the cell nucleus, if you have like these three genes that come close in space, right, then all these genes can be turned on by the same transcription factor. So transcription factor can come in and because these three genes are next to each other, well, they can all be turned on at the same time or turned off at the same time. So if you look at their expression, they actually go up and down together. Okay, so this is very similar to if you look at, for example, stock data, which often goes up and down together. Of course, some might go up more and others might go down more, but this really is all probably induced by some latent factors, right? So here in this case, some latent market variable, whereas in this case, actually these transcription factors that come in and then can turn on or off all of these genes together. And similarly, you have many different applications where you see these kinds of things. Okay, so this is really what we wanted to try to model. Um, with some forms of positive dependence. And as Elena said, MTP2 is one of the strongest forms of positive, is actually the strongest form of positive dependence that is known to date. Okay, it implies all of these other forms. Um, and so what I want to say is like, well, what is the consequence of MTP2 for graphical models? And why is it really exactly the opposite or not compatible with causality? 
Um, so I, mean, I know some came in, I just put down again the definition that Alina already had. The strange definition, so this implies positive association, it's log supermodularity on the density. Um, and so this is, I think, this main theorem, um, which tells you that if you have a density that is um, positive everywhere, and it is MTP2, then it is always faithful to an undirected graph. Okay, so it cannot faithfully represent the distribution that is, uh, that is a given by a directed graph that is not equivalent to an undirected graph. Okay, so if you have, um, you know, something like this graph here, which is really a causal graph, right? This graph is not equivalent to any undirected graph. This distribution encoded by, you know, on this three dimension, on this three um, variable uh, distribution cannot be represented by an MTP2 distribution. Okay, so it is really incompatible with anything causal. If you take another graph, like, you know, this one here, this graph, this graphical model is equivalent to this undirected graphical model. So this one here can be represented by an MTP2 distribution and it is in fact realizable, okay? So any undirected graph is realizable, realizable by an MTP2 distribution. So the two are really incompatible. Um, and if I go back, I mean, somehow this kind of makes sense, right? So if you think about these um, or any of these examples. So here, why do these stock prices vary together? Well, probably not because there is causal relationships between them, right? But there is this latent market variable which just makes that all of these stocks vary together, right? It's not a causal relationship among the observed variables. There is some causal model behind it which goes from the latent variable to the observed ones, but not a causal model among the observed variables. Okay, and the same here in this gene expression data, right? These genes are all it's in co-localized in space. There is this transcription factor that comes in and turns these all on, but that's not a causal model among these genes, right? There is this latent variable. This transcription factor comes in, turns these all on, but that doesn't mean that there is any causal relationships among these three genes, okay? So something that we're really trying to do is like, since these two are really incompatible, right? But you do have a causal relationship among, you know, a transcription factor was produced, say here, right? It goes then to this other location and turns on these genes. So here you have causal relationships among these little clusters, but in these little clusters, you just have this positive dependence. You have MTP2, which is incompatible with these causal relationships that you have outside. Okay, so that's would really be where we would like to go is actually to have a combined model which can be causal and MTP2 at the same, at the same time, but of course within it, it cannot be causal. Okay. So that gives some intuition. So, um, so MTP2 really rules out um, anything causal. Okay. So however, it buys you a whole lot and um, um, and in particular, in applications like this, you do want to be able to model it using MTP2, right? Because you know you have positive dependence, so you do want to be able to encode this. And so since Alina did the non-parametric setting, let me actually show you all of the kind of nice things that we know already that you can get in the parametric setting. Okay, so there were all kinds of um, questions also related to this. So let me um, just talk about exponential families. So what does MTP2 mean for an exponential family and does it buy us anything in terms of modeling um, under MTP2? So this is just to set up the notation. Um, so importantly, I'll just call the, the cone of sufficient statistics will be the C here. Um, T stands for the, um, sorry, this, the cone of, uh, this, this, the, the convex space of canonical parameters will be C and T stands for the sufficient statistics. And what is nice is for any exponential family, MTP2 is always a convex constraint, okay? Um, so how is it always a convex constraint? We can actually literally write down what the constraint is. So you have your original exponential family, whatever you take, Gaussian, easing, whatever you want. Uh, so that's, uh, that defines um, the space of canonical parameters, which is always convex. And now if you add the MTP2 constraint, all you have to do is intersect this convex space with another cone. Um, it's a closed convex cone, and we can actually write down what the dual is of this cone, okay? So for any exponential family, MTP2 is always a convex constraint. 
And it's a super nice convex constraint when you look at quadratic exponential families. So if you look at quadratic exponential families, for example, Gaussian or Ising, then in fact, this cone here is polyhedral. Okay? And the faces of this polyhedron have really nice interpretations. Namely, the faces correspond to conditional independence relations. Okay, so let's just think briefly about the Gaussian setting that Elena told you about. So what does it mean in the Gaussian setting to be MTP2? Well, the constraint is that all entries in the inverse covariance matrix are smaller or equal to zero. Right? So then what is this polyhedral cone? Well, it's the negative orthant. And what are the faces of this negative orthant? So when do you have a zero in the inverse covariance matrix? Well, zeros mean that xi is independent of xj given everything else. Okay? And in fact, the same holds for any quadratic exponential family. So this directly shows you that MTP2 is actually a very nice implicit regularizer. Right? Because in general, if you even have some noise, even if the distribution was MTP2, you sample from it, you'll land outside this cone of MTP2 distributions. Now you do maximum likelihood estimation while you're projecting onto one of the faces. Of course, that means that you will already have some um, conditional independence relations that will be satisfied. Okay, so you'll get sparsity for free just um, by this MTP2 constraint. Okay, so that's uh, for any exponential family, you have that it's a convex constraint, and in fact, for any quadratic exponential family, um, it's always a polyhedral cone, so it's an implicit regularizer. So when you say you get sparsity for free, you're saying if my model is misspecified and then I project onto this model, I'm going to kill a bunch of the parameters that I have. If it's misspecified, but also usually you have some noise, right? Sure. Even if you were MTP2, like in Elena's example, it's for example. Both sides will, exactly, yeah. But in Elena's example, for example, she, it was basically up to noise, it was MTP2, right? So there you would actually get something sparse. Um, but of course, I'm not telling you you should always apply this, right? Um, because you'll get something completely sparse. Um, but what I would like to say is, so I'll tell you all of the nice things that happen under MTP2. And also, since you anyways know that any latent tree model, for example, is MTP2, um, well, you know, modeling under a latent tree model is, is hard, right? It's a very non-convex constraint. This is a less restrictive constraint, but it has all of these nice properties. So I'm just proposing that, well, if you anyways wanted to model under a latent tree model, well, then why not just use this? Okay, so if you're happy with models like that, well, then you should be happy with this because it's implied anyways. Yeah, and I think, you know, many people do like to model with something like factor analysis models or latent tree models, etc. Okay. So that was uh, Gaussian, uh, that was exponential families generally. And let me just actually write out why, why do you get this sparsity? What does this sparsity actually mean? So this is just a Gaussian setting. So this is just a log likelihood. I'm looking at the MLE. So here you maximize the likelihood. As I said, in the Gaussian setting, the MTP2 constraint means that all of the entries in the inverse covariance matrix, which here I denote by this theta, are smaller or equal to zero. If I write down the dual, um, and you look at what is this um, um, complementary slackness condition means that either this has to be equality or here you have to have equality, right? So in particular, if you have MTP2, it's a form of positive dependence. So all of the entries of the covariance matrix have to be larger or equal to zero. So in particular, if you have a negative entry in the sample covariance matrix, these two cannot be equal, which means that you definitely already have to have a zero over here. And this, of course, will imply a lot of other zeros. So you usually get pretty sparse entries. Um, and what else do you get? Well, what is very nice is that you can actually apply it in the high dimensional setting. So this is a result. Um, and this will be interesting here. I think it goes um, to the question about you know, how close might this be to the Gaussian setting when you have like the non-parametric setting. So in the non-parametric setting, you said that the MLE exists when you have three observations. Actually, in the Gaussian setting, the MLE exists with two observations. So it's, it's not much better, right? You're very close there. Um, and again, this is, of course, independent of, um, of the number of variables. So that means that this optimization problem will not go off to infinity, even if you just have two observations independent of the size, even independent of the number of variables that you have in general. Okay, so you can apply this in the high dimensional setting. You don't need any regularizer. And in fact, we can prove that this is, I mean, not this estimator, but a different estimator in the high dimensional setting. It is going to be consistent um, for estimating your, your um, graphical model. And you don't need any tuning parameter for doing this. 
Okay, so standardly for Gaussian graphical models, right, all of your results, for example, graphical lasso, you need to choose your tuning parameter in a certain way in order to get a consistent estimator of your, of your graphical model. And under MTP2, you don't need any of that. So you can prove consistency without actually a particular choice of your tuning parameter. So you get away with a whole lot of stuff um, under MTP2. So it has all these very nice properties that you just get for free. Okay, if you are in a setting where, you know, it might make sense to actually apply these kinds so of things. So I guess you were reasoning about, um, I mean, so the complementary slackness, if you have a negative entry you know, on the right, then you for sure get a zero. But if I have prior knowledge that I know that my MTP2 model is sparse, does it recover it in a regime where the sample complexity is highly sublinear? Uh, so sample complexity results, so all of this is still missing. Yeah, so for now we just have, for now, the, the results we have in terms of sample complexity are exactly, so we don't know how much you're gaining by MTP2. Uh -huh. So it's still the same results as just for Gaussian, in standard Gaussian. Yeah, so all of these results are still missing. That would be very nice to know, actually, what are you gaining. For now, all we can show that you're gaining, so if you add a lambda here, so what can we show we're gaining? We have the same sample complexity results. You don't need incoherence. And the other problem, usually with uh, standard Gaussian graphical model, is that if you increase your lambda, um, it's not monotonic, right? The graph in general becomes sparser, but some edges can appear and disappear. Under MTP2, that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So these are the two things we know you gain, um, but not yet in terms of sample complexity. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is in the Gaussian setting. Um, now in the easing setting, it's actually, you can prove very similar results. Um, so also in the easing setting, of course, in general, you need like a lot of samples, right, for the MLE to exist. Um, so again, in the easing setting, all you need is again about clique size. I mean, before it was like um, just um, two samples. Now it is clique size many samples, namely what do you need? You need to have seen the opposite signs um, of your observations over every edge. Okay, so if I have uh, two edges, I, uh, two nodes, I and J, there is an edge between them. So the MLE will exist if there is a sample that has a one minus one as an observation over this edge and a minus one one as an observation over this edge. So this means again that you're actually um, cutting down a lot um, in terms of the samples you need. Now, how good is this estimator? All of those results are still missing. Um, but we do have also algorithms for computing the MLE under MTP2. You can actually extend the iterative proportional scaling, so the IPS algorithm, um, to the MTP2 setting. And you know that if it converges, um, if the MLE exists, then it will always converge to the MLE. Okay, so you can actually compute it. Um, and just to also show you some applications. Um, so here, for example, in um, psychology, you often um, have these, I mean, they would often apply some factor analysis models where you assume that there is some latent factor that has an effect on many of these different symptoms that people can measure. Um, so that's a very, um, you know, a, a setting where, you know, MTP2 might actually be a, an, a good or constraint to use. Um, so here in particular, we're looking at um, some symptoms of two particular uh, disorders, um, we have about 9,000 individuals, 16 binary variables. So this is two to the 16, right, in terms of um, the dimension of the space. In general, the easing model MLE doesn't even exist. In particular here, you usually have a lot of individuals in one particular cell, right? Most of individuals don't have any symptoms. So there is very few individuals that are in all of these other cells. But you can compute the MLE under MTP2. Um, so this here is just a correlation matrix. And what is nice is you already see, so they're looking at two disorders. Already in the correlation matrix, you see that the kind of the different variables, um, they actually um, separate basically into these two diseases. Um, and this is actually the estimator of the graphical model. And in this particular study here, there were psychologists who just um, described the disease and they're talking about some causal skeleton, which they think, or these clinicians, which they think is there, that in fact, you know, these, this positive correlation among all these variables, that it is driven by, you know, depression, which has a big impact on your weight, your, you know, how well you sleep, suicide rates, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in fact, just by applying MTP2, you just get this out for free. You directly get it out. Um, also, you directly get out, you know, these two diseases have, for example, there are different variables for fatigue 
in the two diseases. There are different variables for the sleep variable. And you see that you know, these edges that we get across also link um, these very similar variables together. So it's kind of nice that you can actually just directly apply this and actually get pretty um, interpretable results. Now, this is, of course, very qualitative. Um, but if you look at finance applications, then you can actually make it quantitative, this comparison. That's why I like these finance applications. Um, so what are we looking at here? So we look at the data of um, the 40 last years. And what are we trying to do? So there, a big question is always, can you get a good covariance matrix estimator? Right? So if you look at, so how can one investment strategy is just get a covariance matrix estimator over all of your stocks and solve this full Markowitz portfolio problem, which gives you the weights, how you should invest. And then you invest based on those. And then you compute again the covariance matrix estimator. You invest based on those, et cetera. Um, and then you can just say, like, how good does your covariance matrix estimator do, right? How much money are you making? So it's a very nice and quantitative um, way of comparing estimators. Um, and here you see um, this ratio for MTP2, which was not even developed for finance. Um, but in fact, even now in the paper, you have like even nonlinear shrinkage, et cetera, which was developed for finance. You will just beat it just by MTP2 um, without even you know, having thought about finance applications in any depth. right? Um, so it seems like MTP2 is actually a very good constraint um, for those kinds of applications um, where you might have like, you know, where people do use factor analysis models and you might have um, this very strong um, latent variable which actually um, pushes um, these, these stocks to be very, very positively correlated. And they're in fact the zeros. So if you even, if it's not MTP2, you might care about where do zeros go, right? Because those might indicate stocks that behave differently than everyone else. So you might want to find these stocks that are not positively correlated with everyone else. Um, so these are exactly the ones that will show up with the zeros in the inverse covariance matrix. So those are interesting again. Okay, so that's just uh, to tell you a bit about the applications of MTP2. Um, but as I said, it's, the, it's not compatible with causality. Okay. Yeah. You can change the weight to be non-negative in this, uh, the, of, your, of your portfolio to be non-negative in here? So this comes out of the Markowitz portfolio problem. So that's just an optimization problem that you solve there. And yeah, there you have non-negative. Here we have non-negative. Non-negative yeah. uh, here we have non-negative constraints, yes. So, okay, so this is just to show, okay, so MTP2 with a graphical model setting, I think has a lot of very, very nice properties um, with a lot of different applications um, apart from the non-parametric setting that we already saw. However, it is the opposite of causality. Um, so if we still want to do something causal, right, because in many different applications, we actually do have um, data, which is interventions. And now we saw we cannot model that with MTP2. Um, there is just no way. It's um, exactly the opposite. So what do you do when you actually do have um, interventional data? Um, and so we're, as I already said at the beginning, we're really interested in genomics applications. What we would really like to do is have like a combined model of MTP2 and causality um, that can, you know, really model these, um, these genes, how they're interacting with each other inside um, the cell nucleus so that you also take into account the spatial locations of these genes. Um, and I think this is one application where you have a lot of interventional data right nowadays. You can just go and knock out any one of the genes you like. But there are many other applications. I mean, think of, I don't know, um, online education, right? Nowadays, there is a lot of interventional data. Think of advertisements. You actually get a lot of interventional data. Um, so in all these settings, you would like to actually be able to use observational and interventional data together. Um, in order to say something about the underlying graphical model, or in this case, about the underlying causal structures. Um, and so there, so we saw at the beginning, so Sewell Wright actually already developed in the 1920s, already developed a framework um, for thinking about causality um, using graphs. And it's really a very, very um, intuitive setting or intuitive framework uh, for thinking about causality. So what does he do? So um, how do we represent causal structures? Well, we're only going to allow directed acyclic graphs, so a particular class of directed graphs. So why no directed cycles? Well, because if you think of causality, it can only be forward in time. 
right? So you cannot cause something that came behind you, hence you cannot have any directed cycles. Okay, so that was the intuition then. Nowadays one can, one can relax these kinds of assumptions, but um, let me just do it in the, in the simplest setting here. So we have a directed acyclic graph um, and we need the distribution to factorize according to this graph. So what does that mean? Well, again, very, very intuitive. So our nodes are going to be the random variables. Um, so each node here, uh, what, what does it mean to factorize according to, this uh, according to this directed acyclic graph? Well, every node is just going to be a function of its parents and some noise. Okay, so this is a completely non-parametric setting. I'm not making any assumptions on these functions. I'm also not making any assumptions on the noise. Okay, so if you're familiar with Bayesian networks, this is just a Bayesian network. So what comes in when you think about causality is exactly this thing about interventions. Okay, so this, this um, graph here does not only encode the observational distribution, which you have here. Um, that's why I have this assignments um, written out. But they also encode any interventional distribution. Okay, so in particular, so how do we think about an intervention? Well, if you intervene somewhere in this graph, like let's say, you know, a very extreme intervention is if you set a particular node to zero. So say I set this node here to zero. Well, then only something downstream changes, right? So if you go in here and instead of this assignment, I'm setting x2 to be equal to zero. Well, then you see that x1 doesn't change, x3 doesn't change, but x4 actually does change, right? Because x2 was set to zero, so x4 is going to change. So interventions have an effect downstream, they don't have an effect upstream. Um, and so when we're thinking about the observational and interventional setting, we don't have only samples from here, but we actually also have samples from this interventional distribution. Okay, so that's the interesting thing that now, you, you know, you went in, you did a particular intervention, so you would like to use this data, right? You would want to use this data where you get to see like what happens when I go in here and I actually set this node here to be equal to zero, for example. Um, more generally, so this is the most extreme intervention when you go in and you just set a node to zero or you just choose it randomly. Um, so these are known as hard interventions because they change the graph structure, right? So if you do a hard intervention, if I just go in and set x2 to zero, well, x1 has no effect on me anymore. Right. X2 is just set to zero, so x1 has no effect on me anymore. So I'm actually changing the graph structure. I could also just remove all of these edges. Okay. So in a hard intervention, you're changing the graph structure. In a soft intervention, it's just everything else. Right. Any way how I can, how I can change the distribution. So you can change it by you know, changing this edge, for example. So this function here of how x1 acts on x2, or you can change the noise. Right? And so now, um, what is new? as compared to you know, research that has been done in the last 40 years or so, which was all in the observational setting, what is new now is that you actually have interventional data. Okay, so you don't have only observations from here, but you actually now also have observations um, from after you do an intervention. So I have, for example, in genomics, I have observations in the normal setting, but I also have observations from, if I go back to this little picture, I also have observations from when I turn off, um, for example, gene three, right? So I turn off gene three, I set it to zero, and then I also get to see, well, how do all the other genes look like after I'm doing this particular intervention? And so the question is, what else can you learn um, from when you actually have such interventional data? Okay, so we have two types of data. We have observational data and interventional data. Um, and we'd like to know what can you actually learn about the graph uh, when you also have interventional data. Um, so again, as in the first part, so let's just only concentrate on actually um, gra learning graphical models. So I would like to learn um, this graph here. Um, and of course, so there has been a lot of work in the observational setting. Um, so maybe let me not, not go into that too much. But the problem was that um, there has been some attempts of, of uh, taking al algorithms from the observational setting and making them interventional. Mm -hmm. um, but none of these have actually given rise to consistent estim estimators. So consistent ways of actually really that at least I can say that if the sample size goes to infinity, I'm actually going to get this graph out or something that is equivalent to this graph out. Um, so I'll tell you a bit about how one can actually build 
algorithms that are consistent um, when you have observational and interventional data. And it somehow also gives some intuition of what is different from the undirected setting to the directed setting. Okay, because it's something very, very simple. So if you know how to do, um, how to learn a graphical model in the undirected setting, well, what makes the problem of causality harder? Well, the problem of causality is only harder because I have directions, right? But uh, there are only certain directions that are allowed, right? It's a directed acyclic graph. So that's an ordering, right? That has to be consistent with an ordering of the variables. So in particular, right, if I give you, if I tell you that this is the undirected graph, and you know, my variables have some numbers. And I also tell you that the ordering is, I don't know, let's do two is smaller than one is smaller than three. Well, then that is enough so that you can tell me what is actually the directed acyclic graph that corresponds to this, right? So here I would just order them. Two is smaller than one, so I'll make all of the edges go out of two. And then two is also smaller than three, so I'll make this edge go out of it. So really, what is different when you're thinking about undirected graphical models or the causal setting is that I not only have to learn the undirected graph, but I also have to learn the corresponding permutation. Right? So uh -huh. Yeah, it's a partial ordering. Yes, but if I give you a total ordering, okay. um, then I'm good, right? Yes, but I would only need a partial ordering. Yes. Okay, and we can talk, actually, that will come up afterwards as well. Okay, so, but. Just as intuition, right, this is what is different. Right? I also have to learn a permutation in addition to the undirected graph. That's all. Um, so let's just use that for learning graphical models. Okay? It's a very simple intuition, and let's just use that. And that will, in fact, give us the first provably consistent algorithm for actually learning a causal graph from a mix of observations and interventions. So let's see how to do that. I mean, the idea is so simple. Um, so what I just said, so a DAG is defined by an ordering. Um, so a permutation and a skeleton, right? If I give you the undirected graph and a permutation, you can spit out the DAG. Okay. So now, um, this was already defined by Perl. He showed that, well, if you give me the correct ordering, then actually learning the corresponding undirected graph is easy. So what do you have to do? And if you remember the Markov properties, that's actually pretty easy. All you have to do is so I give you the ordering, so say one is smaller than two, etc., smaller than p. So all you have to do is test whether, so to know if there is an edge between i and j, so is there an edge between i and j? Well, that's the case if and only if, so you just test is xi independent of xj given everything before in the ordering, right? So in this case, given, you know, my ordering was this, so given everything before in s such that, you know, S is an S if and only if um, S is smaller or equal to this ordering, um, the max of I comma J dependent. Okay. So if the Markov property, right? So if I give you the correct ordering, how do you get the skeleton corresponding to it? Well, I just take two nodes and I just see are they dependent given everything before in the ordering that I was given, and if they're dependent, then there is an edge. Okay, so for every, for every two variables, I just have to test one particular conditional independence relation, and that's known as the minimal IMAP. Okay, so for every ordering, I can give you an undirected graph. This has been well studied. There is an, or, uh, the, there is an operation for doing that. And in fact, if you just go over all possible orderings, and this is something that is actually easier to show, if you go over all possible orderings and you just take the sparsest graph, that's the correct one. So if I would, for every particular ordering, I just construct its corresponding minimal I map, which is given like this, I get a skeleton. I just choose the ordering that is the sparsest one that is actually the correct graph. Okay, in particular if, and this doesn't have any, any assumptions on terms of sparsity. In particular, if the true graph is the full graph, then if you do this, then for every ordering you get the full graph. And actually, all full graphs are equivalent to each other in the causal setting, right? So there's no assumptions on, on sparsity. Um, so if you just go over all orderings, and in fact, the sparsest one is the true one. Now, of course, you don't want to be able, you don't want to go over all orderings. So the question is, can you do that in a greedy way? 
Um, and so what we prove here is that you can actually do this in a greedy way. So, so how does that work? So, okay, so here is the space of all permutations. It's a permutahedron, right? So the convex hull of all permutations um, is a polytope. It's uh, here we have all permutations of length four. It's a three-dimensional polytope, right? Because if you add up all these numbers, they always add up to the same. To the same. So it's a one-dimensional lower space. Um, so a, the permutations of length p will live in a p will build a p minus one-dimensional polytope. Um, and it's a very nice polytope where we actually know what are these edges. So if you are here in some permutation, you want to know who are your neighbors. Well, the neighbors are just given by neighboring transpositions. So here, for example, I transpose 3, 1, I get to this guy. I transpose 1, 2, I get to this guy. Or I transpose the last two guys, I get to this guy. OK, you see that this is very regular, right? Every, every vertex has exactly three outgoing neighbor, has exactly three outgoing edges. So in a in a permutahedron of permutations of length p, you'll have p minus one edges going out. Okay, so now what we would, so for every permutation, we have a corresponding undirected graph. We want to find the sparsest one. Well, we don't want to enumerate all permutations, so wouldn't it be nice if we can just start in any permutation and just do greedy search? So what is greedy search? Well, we have a polytope, so greedy search probably just means going along the edges. Okay. And so what this theorem says is that you can start anywhere. And in fact, there are no local optima that are not global optima. Okay, so I can start anywhere. I look at my neighbors and you know, if they're at least as sparse, I will just go there. And then I look at my neighbors again, if they're at least as sparse as I just go there. And as soon as there are no more neighbors that, are, um, that you can go to, then you know that you actually reach the global optimum. Presumably, the topology of the underlying DAG gives you, you know, bigger or smaller equivalence classes for the uh, Perfect. permutations. So, what kind of condition do you put there? Like, are they actually the kind of condition that will make the equivalence classes big? So, at least it's like a direct one. Mm, okay. So, the equivalence classes are all connected in this in this polytope. That one can prove. Okay. So, an equivalence class of a causal graph will all be connected. So, there are many different ways of getting there. Right. And so uh, I just have to have one way of getting there. Now, this problem is NP-hard, and I'm, of course, not getting around the NP-hardness. So how do you easily see NP-hardness is if you take the full graph. The complete graph, all permutations are equivalent. So I would have to go through all permutations in order to realize that there is nothing sparser. Right? So there, the equivalence class is the full polytope. So I'm actually walking around within the equivalence class, and I'll never be able, I mean, I'm only able to know that I'm done when I have reached all of them. Okay. Yeah, um, but you can make the space smaller and now comes to partial order. So if we had, if we're for example in this graph, we already know that flipping the order between, in this case one and three, will just give the same graph, right? So I shouldn't be really searching over this huge polytope because I already know that some of these will just give me the same graph back. So let me do the following and let me just <laughs> glue together nodes that correspond to the same graph, okay? like here, so that I actually have this partial orders. So I'm just gluing together nodes that correspond to the same graph. Now in general, when you do that, so you take a polytope and you just start gluing together edges, you don't get a polytope back. Okay? But here, if you do that, you actually still, and this we can prove, you still get a polytope back. Okay? So this is really the space we're searching over. So in this particular graph, you know, here there are these edges that you'll glue together and there are here edges that you'll glue together. So this here is still a polytope where each one of these vertices actually corresponds to a unique DAG. Okay. And so this is in fact still a polytope and this is really what we're searching over. So we are taking care of these partial orders. Um, we don't, yes. So this is just a very nice uh, result for the causal inference. We don't need it to be a polytope. We don't care about it. This is a very nice mathematical result. Okay, so why is this? So people in, in like discrete math, they study this polytope for undirected graphs. This is known as the graph associahedron. 
So now we show that actually for DAGs, you can again construct in a very similar way actually a polytope, which just generalizes everything from the undirected setting to the directed setting. That's why this is nice that this actually is still a polytope. For causality, I only care about the graph itself, right? I don't actually care about this being a polytope because I just need the graph structure of this thing. So we don't really know how to actually use that it is a polytope. We're just using the graph structure. And um, what is important from causality is that I can still tell you who my neighbors are without computing the polytope. And this we can do. Okay, so we have a const we know, like if I am here, I compute my graph that corresponds to it. I know who my neighbors are in this polytope without actually constructing the full polytope. That's important otherwise. Um, yeah. We'll be going in, in circles. So if you know that the original thing is, <coughs> is sparse, do you have a much better upper bound of the number of vertices? No, so or actually, yeah. So there is a problem. Uh -huh. So the vertices uh, depend kind of in on the Markov equivalence class size. Mm -hmm. And it is not the case that sparser graphs in general have smaller mark or larger Markov equivalence mm -hmm. class sizes. Mm -hmm. um, so the sparsest, the smallest Markov equivalence class size, and this is all not known. So we actually don't have any formula. <laughs> no formula is known for even if I give you P notes, how many Markov equivalence classes there are. But from uh, simulations, it seems that the smallest Markov equivalence classes are actually reached by medium sized graphs. <laughs> Um, because you need to have a lot of four cycles, but still not a lot of triangles. So it's, it's more complicated than just sparsity. It has to do more with four cycles than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Correct, and that's why I don't want to form the polytope first, right? So that's why what I need is that I know I'm here and I know who my neighbors are in this polytope without ever computing the polytope. Okay? And in fact, I mean, it's very easy. It's like, uh, well, um, so, so your neighbors, if you are in a graph like this, so the only edges that you can flip are edges that are called covered. So these are edges which have the same parents. Okay? So this is a covered edge. So these are exactly the edges that correspond to edges in this polytope. It's always covered edges in the corresponding graphs. Yeah, so it's very nice. You never have to compute this polytope if you want to do causal inference, but it's a nice polytope for the people who study discrete math. Okay, so this is the generalization of the graph for sociohedron, and we can, actually we can actually construct it. It is a matrix polytope. We know exactly how to construct it. Okay, and what is very nice is that actually gives you the first provably consistent algorithm, even when you have interventional data. And here with interventional data, um, you're actually going to gain in terms of computation time. So the intuition, again, is super easy. So let me just do hard interventions, right? So I'm doing a, I'm doing a greedy search over this polytope. So now you also have interventional data. Intervention, let's do hard interventions. So if I'm an intervention, I know that there cannot be any node pointing into me, right? Because I was just set to zero, so nobody has an effect on me. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to go cut off search directions where there will be an edge pointing into me. So if I'm here and I'm looking at this guy over here and there will be, I'm flipping a node pointing into an intervention, I already know it's the wrong, it's the wrong graph. And then I can actually cut off the whole search direction in that direction. And that's actually consistent. Okay, so that's nice. And that works for hard interventions. It even works for soft interventions. And now also, Along this greedy search algorithm, you can even learn the intervention targets. So I don't even have to tell you what in the data, right? You have some that were intervened on node ones and the others on node two. I don't have to give you that. You can actually learn that along the path while you're doing the greedy search. And finally, and now comes like maybe more generalization to pole sets. Um, so you would really love to be able to do this when you also have latent variables. <laughs> okay, so if I don't have latent variables, I just have permutations or you know, partial orders in that sense. Um, but actually here, I really need pole sets, right? So, so when I have latent variables, I also have bidirected edges, right? The latent variable that points to two nodes, I'll have a bidirected edge. This means that they are incomparable. So I need to somehow be able to somehow encode that two nodes are incomparable. Um, and so we have the proof that the sparsest pole set is again the true pole set. Um, we don't have the corresponding proof yet from the previous slide that I can start anywhere and the greedy search will not get stuck. So we've applied this um, to thousands of um, graphs, but we don't have any proof yet that this is actually not going to get stuck. Okay. 
And so with that, um, I think I'm not done right out of time, yeah. So with that, let me just end. Um, so we have applied it to all kinds of genomics applications. I won't talk about it. Um, so I think in terms of graphical models, there's a whole lot of different complex structures that one can um, use. I think MTP2 is one of them um, that I talked about at the beginning, uh, which is a very interesting shape constraint. It gives you very nice properties in terms of um, inducing sparsity, et cetera, without the need of a tuning parameter. You can apply it and gives you consistency even in the high dimensional setting. Um, and I think in terms of causality, um, there's really, I think, very interesting opportunities coming out through the availability of interventional data that lead to new mathematical questions. And in terms of causal inference, I think permutations and post sets are really very natural uh, workhorses for actually solving these kinds of problems and have lead to, led to you know, many new algorithms that are very, very natural when you just think about it um, from the permutations perspective. And so let me thank all the people who are actually involved in this and you guys for your attention.